Hello, my name is Quentin Broussard. I'm assistant professor at California Health Sciences University, and today we will be discussing nutrition support. The reason why we're discussing this topic today is that nutrition is an important part of treatment for patients who are unable to attain as well as sustain oral nourishment. So essentially nourishment that we get from eating food normally. Some patients aren't able to eat food normally, such as those who may be hospitalized or even those who do not even have functional GI tracts. So those patients need specialized nutritional strategies such as enteral and parental nutrition, which we'll discuss to sustain their nutritional needs. Our objectives today will be to assess nutrition status and nutrition requirements based on patient parameters. We'll describe components of enteral and parental nutrition, how they're the same and how they're different. Um, identify indications for enteral as well as parental nutrition. Classify enteral and parental nutrition access routes, so how we are essentially giving the enteral and parental nutrition. Recognize complications of enteral and parental nutrition. Discuss drug nutrient interactions and compatibility is issues associated with enteral and parental nutrition, which are important for pharmacists to know. And then on the lab day, we will essentially bring together all of these components to prescribe appropriate parental nutrition formulas. So we'll start off with a patient case. AF is a 42-year-old male. He's 5'7 and 65 kilos. Presenting to the emergency department with sepsis as a result of pneumonia. He was subsequently intubated and transferred to the intensive care unit, or ICU. A central line and nasal gastric tube were placed in the ICU. He currently has a functional gastrointestinal or GI tract and is not currently on vasopressors. After doing a nutritional assessment, AF does not appear malnourished. So case question one, based on weight-based equations, what are AF's calorie requirements? Is it 15 to 20 kilocals per kilo actual body weight per day? 20 to 25 kilocals per kilo actual body weight per day? 25 to 30 kilocals per kilo actual body weight per day, or greater than 30 kilocals per kilo actual body weight per day. Which of the following types of nutrition is the most appropriate for AF to receive? Is it oral nutrition, enteral nutrition, or EN, peripheral parenteral nutrition, or PPN, or central parenteral nutrition, CPN? And as a follow-up to case question two, which of the following is the most likely complication of the type of feeding selected in case question two? Is it abdominal distension, hypokalemia, metabolic bone disease, or PN-associated liver disease? So after today's talk, you should be able to answer each of these questions confidently. In order to understand how to prescribe enteral as well as parenteral nutrition, the first thing that you have to do is do a nutritional or a nutrition assessment on your patient. Nutrition screening and assessment are important in determining nutrition care. So this can be determining what route of nutrition that a patient is going to receive, how many calories they're going to receive, how much protein they're going to receive, how much dextrose, or even how much fat they're going to receive, or if they're even going to receive fat at all, which we'll discuss a little bit later. One of the goals of nutritional assessment is to identify nutritional risk or malnutrition. Whenever I say nutritional risk, so these are patients who may not be able to sustain their nutritional requirements via oral nutrition alone. And a lot of these patients will actually come into the hospital um, and because of the symptomatology of the disease states that they have may not be able to eat on their own. Mm -hmm. Malnutrition is something that we'll talk about on the next slide.
but one of the goals of a nutritional assessment is to potentially determine whether our patient is malnourished because that can also guide what type of nutrition that we provide as well as how quickly we provide nutrition. Some nu nutritional assessment components that are important to inquire about or to obtain include a history and a diagnosis. So what is their current nutritional status in terms of have they been diagnosed with malnutrition previously? Or do they have some kind of current or past history of inflammation? Inflammation is something very important to determine especially in hospitalized patients because most hospitalized patients will have some kind of degree of inflammation because they are acutely ill. Whenever your patient has some type of inflammation, their calorie requirements may actually be increased. So this is important information to obtain. A physical examination. So not just examining a patient physically, you know, and auscultating them, palpating them. But things such as weight gain or weight loss history may determine what we do nutritionally. So say if a patient is, has a weight loss history recently, we may be inclined to give more nutrition to those patients, particularly calorie-wise, to try to meet that patient's nutritional needs. Some other things that you can look at physical exam-wise are SERS criteria, which we discussed in the sepsis and septic shock talk. Um, these are indicators of potential inflammation, and as we talked about just now, inflammation may drive up calorie requirements. Another thing that you may look at in a physical examination is edema, for example. Now, edema can be a potential um, symptom of malnutrition as these patients may not be producing adequate amounts of protein or getting adequate amounts of protein in their diet. So one example where I think of edema is patients who have cirrhosis. Now if you remember with when you talked with Dr. F about cirrhosis, these patients may not be able to make albumin properly or as much as say if they did not have liver disease. If you're not able to make albumin, which is a protein, then in those cases you may actually start leaking out your intravascular fluids from your actual systemic circulation out into the interstitial spaces of your body. And one thing that governs whether or not that protein is synthesized properly is getting protein in your diet. Remember, protein in your diet is made up of amino acids. And if you don't have enough amino acids as well as other components, you're not able to properly synthesize those proteins and adequate um, components for your body to function. Um, some other people may use anthropometric data, so things such as height, weight. Um, some people may even use skin folds or different circumferences such as waist circumference to determine a patient's nutritional needs. Laboratory information is also important in determining nutritional risk as well as nutritional assessment. So things such as serum albumin, prealbumin, and CRP may be obtained, though these markers are not very specific for nutritional risk. They may be obtained. So we discussed a little bit about um, serum albumin. Prealbumin compared to albumin has a longer half-life and may be a little more reliable to use than albumin itself. CRP is another marker of inflammation, so C-reactive protein. So if those levels are high, you may have a patient who may be in some kind of inflammatory state. Dietary data. So what has their recent diet history been? Have they been eating lately? Have they not eaten in a week? All these things may be important in determining how much or what kind of nutrition we're going to give a patient. Another thing is functional performance. So strength as well as physical performance. 
you know, are is the patient bed bound? You know, if the patient is bed bound, you know, some patients who are in bed for prolonged periods of time may have high degrees of muscle wasting. Um, and in the ICU where I practice, this muscle wasting may occur at anywhere from one to two pounds per day. So after a couple of weeks of being in a bed and not being mobile, you may actually go from a normal nutrition status to that of a malnutrition status. So these are all factors that are taken into account in terms of nutritional assessment. Many times in practice, dietitians will do these, but as a pharmacist, it's important to be aware of some of these factors that are taken into account because sometimes we are actually the ones prescribing the nutrition ourselves, such as parental nutrition, which is commonly done by pharmacists in hospitals. One big factor in determining a patient's nutritional requirements as well as what type of nutrition they may get in addition to how quickly a patient may be fed is determining whether or not a patient has malnutrition. So in addition to the other factors that we just discussed, there are other specific factors that may determine a diagnosis of malnutrition. There are many different factors to consider. What malnutrition is, it can be a consequence of nutrient imbalance. Most of the time, it's a patient not getting enough nutrients. However, sometimes, even in patients who may be overweight or obese, they may also have characteristics of malnutrition because they may not get certain things in their diet, such as vitamins or trace elements. The most important factors that I want to highlight here for you in terms of things that you'll need to know to determine whether or not a patient is malnourished include weight loss and energy intake. So important things to realize would be if a patient has had any degree of weight loss. The numbers that are highlighted here are numbers that you need to know in order to determine whether or not a patient has a malnutrition diagnosis. So say if they have a weight loss of greater than 5% in a month, greater than 7.5% in three months, greater than 10% in six months, or greater than 20% in a year, all of these are significant amounts of weight loss that can put your patient in a malnutrition diagnosis. Another big thing is energy intake. So if a patient has had less than 50% of normal energy intake for greater than five days or equal to five days, or less than, less than or equal to 75% of their normal nutritional intake or energy intake for greater than one month, those are big factors to determine a malnutrition diagnosis. Another consideration that is not listed in this table on the right here is BMI. So determining BMI, remember BMI is kilograms divided by meters squared. That will be an important calculation to remember. Um, determining BMI is important to determine whether or not a patient has a malnutrition diagnosis. So patients who are underweight are at the biggest risk of malnutrition and may actually be considered malnourished. Patients who have a normal BMI who are overweight or obese may be at less risk of malnutrition. However, if they have any of these three sets of factors, that being a patient who is underweight with a BMI of less than 18.5, um, a decreased energy intake, as we discussed, or a weight loss history, which we discussed here. Any of these three factors can dictate a malnutrition diagnosis. So this, these factors will be important to remember later whenever we start to talk about enteral nutrition as well as parental nutrition. Because if a patient is malnourished, those patients will need nutritional intervention immediately.
just to kind of give you a little bit of context into malnutrition, many different disease states are associated with malnutrition. Now this chart here is not necessarily comprehensive, but they, this just gives you some idea of the types of disease states you may be, see associated with malnutrition. And remember, things that are related to malnutrition are some kind of degree of inflammation, and you see some of those disease states here. So while this chart is not necess necessary for you to memorize, it's just to kind of give you a little bit of concept or context, actually, in terms of patients who may have malnutrition. The next step in nutritional assessment, after you've done your nutrition assessment and physical exam and whatnot, is a determining energy expenditure. And this consists of different factors, such as your basal energy expenditure. So, you know, how much energy do you actually need throughout the day? Um, Diet-induced thermogenesis. So how much energy is expended whenever you are actually eating? as well as energy used for physical activity daily. And these requirements are actually increased in patients who are sick or injured. So essentially patients who are coming into the hospital may have increased energy requirements. And whenever you're determining energy expenditure, are essentially calories that a patient is going to receive in a day. There are many different ways to assess this. These can be assessed through weight-based equations, predictive equations, or indirect calorimetry. The most commonly used in practice is weight-based equations, and these will be equations that you will need to know. Predictive equations are just simple formulas, and indirect calorimetry is a special method that is used to determine energy requirements. And an example of what indirect calorimetry is is actually shown here on the right. They actually will use a patient's um, carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange and to determine their nutritional requirements. While indirect calorimetry is the gold standard for determining a patient's nutritional requirements, it is very expensive and is not commonly done due to cost as well as availability. So, weight-based equations or predictive equations are more commonly used. To give you an idea of what weight-based equations look like, it's essentially determining a patient's kilocalorie requirements based on their weight. And most of the time, these weight-based equations are in kilograms. So did, whenever you actually assess a patient, you can assess them as either healthy or potentially ill or under metabolic stress. And whenever a patient is ill or under metabolic stress, they're commonly in the hospital. So if you have a hospitalized patient, they will most likely fit into one of these three illness categories here, depending on what their BMI is. Now, if you have a healthy patient, however, their kilocalorie requirement can vary and it depends on very, very different factors such as disease state, age, gender, etc. But we're just assigning different ranges here to kind of stratify things out and make things very simple. And that's what one of the benefits of using weight-based equation is to make things very simple. So these are all um, ranges that you will need to know for examination purposes, as well as whenever we actually start writing P and formulas. So if you have a healthy patient, for example, that has minimal illness, so this, these are patients that are not in the hospital, your daily adult requirements, and we're going to focus on adults primarily in this presentation, pediatrics are a special population. Um, but in healthy adult patients, normal calorie requirements are about 20 to 30 kilocals per kilo of actual body weight per day. Now, whenever your patient comes in to the hospital or if they're, are, they have some kind of illness or metabolic stress and they are less than 30 
on a BMI scale, then those patients will receive anywhere from 25 to 30 kilocals per kilo of actual body weight per day. If their body mass index is between 30 and 50, then this requirement actually changes because think about patients who are obese, they might not actually require as much calories. These patients do not require as much, so they will only receive 11 to 14 kilocalories per kilo of actual body weight per day. In terms of patients who are morbidly obese with a BMI greater than 50, these patients receive 22 to 25 kilocalories per kilo of ideal body weight per day. Emphasis on the ideal body weight portion of this part of the weight-based equation. This is the only one that has ideal body weight here. So whenever you calculate this out, you have to calculate these patients' ideal body weight first before you calculate out their energy requirements. Another population you may see are burn patients. Now burns are not as common, but it's important to realize because these patients have extensive amount of burn injuries that they are very hyper catabolic and will need much higher requirements than the other populations that we just discussed. And these patients will need greater than or equal to 30 kilocalories per kilo of actual body weight per day. Now going on to the another type of way to calculate calorie requirements, another way is predictive equations. So um, one other thing I forgot to mention on the previous slide is if these things are bolded here, these are things that you will need to know for examination purposes. So you know that for the weight-based equations, I want you to know each of these because these will be important in determining a patient's calorie requirements. Now in terms of the predictive equations, I don't expect you to memorize these but they are another method for you to calculate a patient's energy requirements. So some clinicians will actually use predictor equations, some will use weight-based equations. There are more than actually, there are more than 200 predictive equations in existence. These are just some examples of some commonly used ones. Um, the Harris-Benedict equation is probably one of the more well-known ones. Um, one problem with the Harris-Benedict equation in using this is that patients who are critically ill may not get as accurate um, calorie readings from the Harris-Benedict equation due to the Harris-Benedict equation being originally studied in normal healthy patients. So that's just one limitation of this equation. Um, another equation is the mifflin saint jour equation. Um, and then you also have the Penn State equation, which the Penn State derives from the Mifflin equation. You actually have to calculate the Mifflin to determine your Penn State requirements. So these are just examples. Again, you do not need to know these equations. Um, but if asked in practice, you may actually need to use these equations. And these are just here for your reference. So now that we talked a little bit about nutritional assessment and determining a patient's calorie requirements, um, let's talk about patient's macronutrient requirements as well as fluid requirements. So macronutrients are nutrients which are protein, fat, or carbohydrates. So protein are your basic amino acids, fat is lipids, and carbohydrates is dextrose. Protein is, again, made up of amino acids, and important functions of protein include growth, movement, and maintenance of lean muscle. So whenever you take in protein, the idea is to build muscle, kind of like Popeye here with his big muscles on the right. Um, so I like to think, whenever I think of protein, of bodybuilders. These bodybuilders out um, that you may see at the gym um, 
like to emphasize protein intake because that actually builds up lean body muscle. Other functions of protein in the body are enzymes, so enzymes are a type of protein, um, hormones, um, immunity, which is one of the biggest things or one of the biggest benefits that protein allows because protein will actually promote wound healing. So if you have a patient who is sick or has some kind of wound, protein may actually help in boosting their immunity to provide for wound healing. Proteins also play roles in genes transcription and translation. They play a role as buffers in the body for acid-base balance. And they can also play roles in transportation and storage, um, such as ferritin, whenever you think about blood and iron um, transfer. An important note for protein is that it provides four kilocalories per gram of protein. So if you have a patient who requires 100 grams of protein per day, that patient would then require four or would receive 400 kilocalories from their protein. So this is a very important number to know in terms of calculating out a patient's macronutrient requirements. Overall protein requirements for patients make up about 20 to 25 percent of total calories per day. And this is not a hard and fast number. Um, patients may need more or may need less. So this is just essentially a road map of an estimation of the patient's protein requirements. Again, you'll note some bolded text here. So these are numbers and things that you'll need to know. For healthy patients, so these are patients that are not in the hospital, um, or patients who may be in the hospital but may not be acutely ill. So this is what the essentially healthy adult, adult is referring to. If you have a patient who is a healthy adult, um, and is not critically ill, for patients who are less than or equal to 60, these patients actually may require about anywhere from 0 0.8 to 1.0 grams per kilo per day of protein. And this is based on actual or ideal body weight, whichever is lower if it's not indicated in this chart. Now, for patients who are healthy or not critically ill, who are greater than 60 years of age, they require about 1.5 grams per kilo per day. Now, this is much higher compared to those who are less than 60 because whenever patients get older, their lean body muscle mass starts to decrease as a result of age and processes that happen with aging. Therefore, to try to preserve this lean body muscle mass, these patients who are greater than 60 will require higher protein requirements, such as that provided by 1.5 grams per kilo per day, compared to the patients who are less than 60, which those patients only need 0 0.8 to 1. So, whenever you think about healthy patients, or patients who are just in the hospital but are not critically ill, those patients essentially will need a basal amount of protein. Now, whenever you come into my practice in the ICU, for example, that requirement goes up because they are critically ill and they have a high degree of inflammation. And these patients will actually require anywhere from 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilo per day of protein. Now, if you're on modalities such as CRRT, which is continuous renal replacement, which can actually remove a lot of protein, these patients actually can get up to 2.5 grams per kilo per day of protein because some of that protein that they're being given is being taken off by the CRRT machine. So it's important to be able to distinguish when a patient is critically ill and a patient is healthy or just, you know, um, on an acute care floor and is not very sick.
So patients who are critically ill will be in the ICU. Patients who are healthy or, you know, moderately ill will be either outside of the hospital or outpatient, or they may be on an acute care floor on the inpatient side. And we'll kind of make this distinction again in class whenever we go over the bats. Um, now, depending on what your BMI is, if you have a higher BMI, you actually may require um, a different protein requirement. So patients who have a BMI of 30 to 40 will require 2 grams per kilo per day ideal body weight. And patients who have a BMI greater than 40 will get 2.5 grams per kilo per day ideal body weight. For patients who have burn injuries that are major, 2.5 to 3 grams of actual body weight will need to be provided to promote wound healing as well as healing from the burn. As you note, these last three are not bolded. These are ones that I don't expect you to know off the top of your head for examination purposes. But they may come up in examples um, on the bat or in the lab day. So just keep this as a reference. The next macronutrient we'll discuss is fat. So fat is divided into essential fatty acids and non-essential fatty acids. Um, non-essential fatty acids are the ones that our body will actually synthesize. Essential fatty acids are ones that our body does not synthesize and need to be obtained either through diet or through other means. Now, whenever we talk about fat in terms of nutrition support, Fat is provided as dietary lipids for internal nutrition, or for parental nutrition, it's provided as IV fat emulsion. And the most common type of IV fat emulsion is intralipid, which comes as a 20% concentration. So as you see here, this intralipid bag is one of the most common types of fat emulsion that is provided in the United States. So this is a 250 ml bag, and it is 20% um, fat emulsion. So if you think about it, 20% um, provides 20 grams per 100 ml. So this intralipid bag here, that's 250 ml, will provide 50 grams of fat per day. Or um, depending on how many you want to give, not necessarily per day. Um, but one bag is 50 grams. They're commonly given either every day or every other day, or sometimes even once or twice a week, depending on your patient's nutritional requirements. Another formulation that just came out is Smoth Lipid, which is another type of um, IV fat emulsion, which right now is not commonly seen, but just to give you some exposure, I listed it here on the slide. Another source where you can get IV, um, nutrition via lipids is from actually propofol. Remember we talked about propofol in status epilepticus, how propofol actually um, is fat emulsion based and it contains 1.1 kilocals per mil in the propofol solution. So if your patient is receiving propofol, they're receiving a lipid source and they're receiving calories. Um, it's important to note that this lipid emulsion appears milky white, as you see here. And functions of fat in general include formation of cellular membranes, different signal transduction pathways, such as cytokines, as well as gene expression. Um, one thing I want to note is that there is a caution for patients with egg allergy who get IV fat emulsion. Um, and this is important to note though it doesn't happen very often. There's many misconceptions about the egg allergy. The egg allergy is actually related to egg phospholipid that's included in this intralipid formulation. So if your patient has anaphylaxis due to egg allergy, that may be a contraindication for them to get IV fat emulsion. Now, in terms of fat, fat calories are very, 
um, distinct. So if you are eating regular normal dietary fat, such as fat that's provided via oral nutrition or enteral nutrition, that fat provides nine kilocalories per, and this should actually say fat here, not protein. That will be corrected on your readiness PowerPoint. Um, but dietary fat provides nine kilocalories per one gram of fat. Now, if you have fat emulsion, it's a little different because fat emulsion contains different um, phospholipids, which contribute to the actual calorie requirement provided. So these patients will actually receive 10 kilocalories per one gram of fat here. Fat requirements generally make up about 10 to 35 percent of total calories um, and there's no absolute recommendation for daily provision of enteral fat other than the fact that patients who are getting fat should not get more than one gram per kilo per day of fat. Some criteria to hold IV fat emulsion would be if your patient has triglycerides greater than 400 to 500 milligrams per deciliter or if your patient um, has some type of hemodynamic instability as fat may be actually related to infection risk. So patients who come in who are in septic shock may not get fat immediately. They may actually wait and give them fat about seven to ten days later. Carbohydrates are the next macronutrient that we have. And these are typically provided as dextrose, particularly in parental nutrition formulations. The functions include, um, for carbohydrates, include glycolysis, um, glycogenesis, which is production of glycogen, ATP production, as well as serum glucose maintenance. And again, this provides 3.4 kilocals per one gram of carbohydrate or dextrose. So dextrose is, will be corrected here as well on this slide. But this will be important to know in terms of determining the patient's actual um, calorie requirements. In terms of dextrose, dextrose provides the majority of calories per day at about 45 to 65 percent of total calories. I like to think about it as providing about half, 50 percent. Now your minimum daily requirement for your bodily functions to go on is 150 grams of dextrose per day. So you can either start at that 150 grams per dextrose per day, which is what I typically like to do for my um, TPNs, or you can start anywhere from two to three grams per kilo on day one. And this is to pre prevent refeeding syndrome, which we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk specifically about PN. Now, after day one, you can titrate by 100 grams per day as, as tolerated to whatever your goal dextrose requirement is based on the amount of daily provision that you're providing with it. Now, just for reference, some people may calculate what's called a glucose oxidation rate, which is essentially the amount of glucose that you're administering um, over time. And that daily requirement um, that a patient will need from carbohydrates or dextrose will rarely exceed five milligrams per kilo per minute, just an FYI. Um, Dextrose requirements are usually calculated last when I rewrite a parental nutrition formula, which we'll talk about on the lab day. Fluid requirements. Fluid requirements are dependent on many different factors. Um, one of the most common ones is disease states, which we'll mention at the bottom of this slide. But in general, daily fluid requirements estimate anywhere from 30 to 40 mils per kilo about one mil per one kilocal 
per day ingested, or around 1,500 mils per meter squared. These are not numbers you need to know, but we will use them in terms of calculating fluid requirements on the bat, as well as the lab day for TPN. Now, some patients may re require more fluids, such as patients who are highly inflammatory, have fevers, or are using up a significant amount of fluid in their bodies. However, there are some patients where you actually may consider fluid restriction, which will be much less than the fluids provided here. And those patients are patients who have congestive heart failure, end-stage renal disease, or cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease. So in each of these disease states, patients may actually accumulate fluid, which may be potentially detrimental to them. And whenever you're writing for parental nutrition formulas and you have a set fluid requirement or a set rate of your parental nutrition bag that you want to run your parental nutrition bag at, these disease states are important to remember because they might dictate a fluid restriction in your TPN bag. So now we've talked about macronutrients and fluid requirements. Let's talk about micronutrients. Micronutrients are composed of electrolytes, trace elements, and vitamins. Electrolytes are one of the biggest things that we need to be wary of as pharmacists, particularly in the replacement of electrolytes as well as electrolytes in parental nutrition. Now, if you remember back in Patient Care 1, Dr. Hagop talked with you about fluids and electrolytes specifically. Now, I'm going to list them out here, um, but it's important to remember back to patient care one in terms of general about some of these different electrolytes because some of these are managed in different ways. Um, now, some common nutrition electrolytes that we put in parental nutrition, for example, are sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and chloride. And each of them has different salts that are associated with them, as you see here. Um, it's important to note for phosphorus, phosphorus is actually measured in millimoles, um, and the products are actually phosphate-based, so the salt base. Now, whenever you convert millimoles to mill equivalents by using stoichiometry, there may be some differences in terms of the amount of sodium and potassium that are actually provided. So, for example, 10 millimoles of sodium phosphate is actually equal to 13.3 mil equivalents of sodium. Remember, sodium phosphate provides sodium and phosphate. So this is essentially different by a factor of 1.33. So essentially what you do is you multiply the millimoles times 1.33 and you get your mil equivalents. In terms of sodium phosphate, I'm sorry, potassium phosphate, Potassium phosphate differs by a factor of 1.47, which a lot of clinicians will actually round up to 1.5, which is also okay. But in general, uh, potassium phosphate of 10 millimoles is equal to potassium of 14.7 mil equivalents. Another big thing to realize with phosphate is that you have potential for precipitation with calcium um, particularly if you have high amounts in the TPN bag. One general rule that may be followed, which is not you know, purely evidence-based, it's a little more of art, but if your millimoles of phosphorus plus your milliequivalents of calcium exceeds or is equal to 40, that might be something to look at in terms of whether or not your bag is actually going to precipitate in terms of your TPN. There are also other things that are looked at, such as um, calcium phosphate curves, um, which can be um, 
used in the hospital to determine whether or not your TPM bag will actually precipitate or not. These are some of the daily standard requirements for electrolytes, um, particularly for patients who are getting parental nutrition or PN. Now, I don't want you to memorize these numbers. These will not be tested, but you will need to um, have reference for them whenever we start actually writing parental nutrition formulas. So it's important to note here that calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, sodium, and potassium all have different requirements here. Now acetate and chloride are a little different because acetate and chloride, the most important thing to realize with these is that they're actually regulators of acid-base balance. Acetate will actually be converted to bicarb in the liver, and as a result of that, acetate is a base, or I think of it as a base. Chloride, however, is an acid. So depending on your patient's actual bicarb level, which we'll see on BMP, as well as potentially ABGs that we'll work with, you may need to titrate your acetate and your chloride appropriately. Now, if your patient starts out, you know, with normal bicarb, normal chloride levels, um, you may actually split this up 50-50, so such that 50% of your requirements were provided by acetate and 50% by a chloride, particularly for your sodium and potassium salts. This will make a little more sense whenever we actually start writing parental nutrition formulas. It's important also to be aware about the different dosage forms that are available for each of these. Now, the ones that are listed on the previous slide will be important for you to know, but this is just kind of a relisting of most of them. So we talked about electrolytes as micronutrients. Trace elements are also important in the diet. And some common nutritional trace elements include chromium, copper, iron, manganese, selenium, and zinc. Now, in terms of your actual requirements per day, you will actually see them listed here. These are not numbers that you need to know. Um, one thing that is to be noted, though, is iron is typically not routinely added to PN formulations, um, particularly PN formulations that include fat, protein, and dextrose all together, which are known as three-in-ones because iron can actually cause what's called cracking of the fat emulsion component of the TPN or a separation of the fat emulsion which would make it incompatible and if you have a bag that is cracked and you infuse it into a patient you have potential for incompatibility issues as well as administration issues related to that and it can actually harm the patient. Now, some trace element considerations that I, I typically think of for peripheral nutrition or PN. Um, one thing that you can add to PN formulations is multi-trace 5, which this is actually provided typically as one mil um, daily requirement. Now, there's another formulation that's not used as much as multi-trace, which is called Atom LN. But one of the problems with Atomel is that it contains iron, which we just mentioned may crack a TPN bag that contains fat emulsion. There are also some concerns with trace elements whenever it comes to patients who have um, hepatic elimination issues, such as those who have cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease, or have some kind of acute liver injury. And this is specifically with copper and manganese. These two trace elements are eliminated by a hepatic and biliary elimination. And as a result of that, if you have hepatic disease, um, which may actually slow down the elimination or stop elimination of these components, you may develop toxicity if you give normal amounts daily.
Therefore, it may be considered that you reduce trace elements, such as multi-trace 5, for patients who have TBLA greater than or equal to 2. Now, this is not an evidence-based recommendation. This is more of an artful recommendation that a lot of dietitians as well as pharmacists follow. Um, so you may actually hold multi-trace completely, or you may give a smaller amount. But the main thing here is that you may potentially have to reduce your trace element provision if your T billy is greater than or equal to 2. Um, now, in terms of renal elimination, so if you have patients who have renal disease, there's not that big of a concern with the trace elements, specifically with zinc, selenium, and chromium, since those are the ones that are eliminated renally. Um, Especially if your patient is on renal replacement therapy, particularly continuous renal replacement therapy, as we mentioned before, CRRT can take off a lot of protein macronutrients, as well as it can take off micronutrients as well. If you remember back to um, your dialysis lectures from last year in patient care one. Vitamins. Vitamins are provided to all patients every day except whenever they're in shortage, or if you have a patient who has a diagnosis of hypervitaminosis, which doesn't happen very often. Um, but sometimes these formulations do become short and you may have to ration them out. Otherwise, you provide them to these patients daily. Um, this table on the right side just gives you a general idea of um, the composition of a lot of these multivitamin products, particularly multivitamin infusion. Um, which comes in two different forms, multivitamin infusion 12 or multivitamin infusion 13. The difference between the two is that one of them includes um, philoquinone, which is also known as vitamin K, one of them does not, and it's provided as 10 mils daily. Um, this is the most common type of multivitamin infusion that's provided, or a um, multivitamin that's provided. Another one um, is also known as Infuvite, which you won't see very often. It's just another type of multivitamin infusion that's very similar to what you see here um, in this table on the right. One important thing to know about multivitamin is it actually will make P and appear yellow because the multivitamin infusion is yellow. So if you ever wonder what the color comes from, it's from the vitamins. So now we talked about a little bit of the basics of um, basic macronutrient and micronutrient and fluid requirements as well as assessment of these patients. Now we're going to actually use that information to describe enteral nutrition as well as parenteral nutrition. And we'll start with enteral nutrition specifically. So enteral nutrition is also known as tube feeding. And it's essentially delivery of nutrients via a tube into the gastrointestinal tract. And you can also deliver medications via this route, which we'll talk about shortly. It provides calories in the form of micro macronutrients, so fat, carbohydrates, protein, as well as micronutrients, electrolytes, trace elements, and vitamins to patients. It's very important to realize how enteral nutrition is given. So some common forms of administration of enteral nutrition, as well as the medications down feeding tubes include nasogastric, nasojejunal, as well as a PEG or a PEG tube, which is percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy or jejunostomy. So the most common route of enteral nutrition is actually via nasogastric tube. And what happens is they essentially insert this tube into the nose and they filter it down into the gastric area or the stomach. And this is where nutrients will be delivered. Um, now you also have other things like orogastro tubes, nasoduodenal tubes, other things of that nature. Basically, the name goes off of where it's inserted at, which is the beginning part most of the time. 
And then the last part is where it, the tube actually terminates or ends. So nasogastric insert in the nose. Um, gastric, the last part, terminates in the gastric area or the stomach. Nasojejunal, for example, in, enters through the nasal passage, just like nasogastric, but terminates in the jejunal, which is part of your small intestine. Now, these are typically um, inserted nasogastric most commonly whenever a patient may be admitted to the hospital or it may be realized that the patient may not be able to tolerate oral feeds alone. Nasojejunal may be inserted if a patient um, does not tolerate nasogastric tubes or it's predicted that they may not tolerate nasogastric tube. Now, this other option over here, the main option, percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, gastrostomy, a PEG tube, or a PEG tube, which is a jejunostomy, will typically be inserted after a few weeks of patients being on tube feeding via nasogastric or nasojejunal tube. And the reason why these are actually inserted um, is for long-term use. So if a patient has been on a nasogastric tube for a few weeks, this type of um, tube will be inserted into either the stomach or to, into the jejunostomy. So these are direct insertions, not through the nasal passage. So these will be essentially put in percutaneously um, as part of a surgery or procedure um, by a physician. So these just allow a little bit more direct delivery of nutrients into the GI tract. Also another thing that they allow for is a little bit more concealment um, that a patient is receiving tube feeds because patients who have a nasogastric or nasojejunal tube, it's very obvious. And some patients actually go around um, in normal living with these um, PEG or PEJ tubes. So it makes it a little easier from the public perspective because some people may be, you know, a little bit nervous or anxious um, walking around with a nasogastric or nasojejunal tube. Here are just some of the formulas that um, may be prescribed enteral nutrition wise. Um, commonly, pharmacists don't prescribe enteral nutrition. There are some places that pharmacists do, but this is just to kind of give you an idea of what the formulas look like. These bottles here at the top are the actual tube beading that will go um, down the nasal. Jejunal, I'm sorry, the nasal jejunal or the nasal gastric tubes or the PEG tubes. Um, you also have other formulas here um, which can be used for oral supplementation after the patient, for example, um, is done with internal nutrition. Or they may actually be used as supplements. So this is just to kind of give you an idea of the variety of products that they have available. And they all differ depending on um, their actual purpose. Some of them are disease specific, such as nephro. Nephro is an act actually a kidney formula, which has reduced electrolytes for kidney patients. Um, or 2-cal HN, which is a little bit more concentrated of a formula, which may be given to patients who are fluid restricted. So enteral nutrition indications. So essentially what we need to know as pharmacists in terms of enteral nutrition is that it's given to patients who are unable to achieve adequate nutrition from oral diet alone. So these patients have some reason why they can't take in an oral diet. The important thing to remember with enteral nutrition is you have to have a functional GI tract to receive enteral nutrition. If your GI tract is not functional, then that may actually be an indication for parental nutrition, which we'll talk about a little later. Some potential indications um, for internal nutrition is if you have neurological impairment, so patients may not be able or have the capacity to think to be able to eat. 
say if a patient is intubated. Now, while you think intubation may be a preclusion for enteral nutrition, actually they can still insert a nasogastric tube whenever you intubate a patient. So basically, the, in, um, the endotracheal tube whenever you intubate a patient may actually run parallel to the nasogastric tube that's inserted. So you can still get adequate nutrients um, via enteral nutrition or that tube feeding modality. Some patients may have organ dysfunction, pancreatitis. Some of them have may, may have anorexia and may not want to eat on their own. And in those cases, enteral nutrition may be indicated. Some may have a failure to thrive, which essentially just means that for one reason or another, they are not able to carry out their normal acti activities of daily living and they're not able to thrive um, in humanity on their own. Um, other indications include esophageal or intestinal atresia or narrowing. So say if a patient has a narrow esophagus, for example, that can only fit in so much, they may be able to still stick a tube down there um, even though it is a little bit narrow, it may still be able to get through, but they wouldn't be able to tolerate normal food um, like a normal person. And then other states would include um, sepsis, burns, post-surgical, um, or other cases. The important part to remember is that it's given to patients who are not able to achieve adequate nutrition from the oral diet alone, so if they can do oral diet, do oral diet and you have to have a functional GI tract to receive this. This route here, or this algorithm here, actually shows a little bit about when you would choose enteral versus parenteral nutrition. So if you have a patient who needs nutrition support and can't tolerate diet orally, this is essentially a decision algorithm to use. And the main part of this that I want you to get out of is basically anything um, is basically this upper part right here. So if your patient, as we stated, has a functional GI tract, they will get enteral nutrition. If they do not, then they will get parenteral nutrition. Potentially. Okay, when do you start enteral nutrition on a patient? So if you have patients where they are not tolerating oral diet and EN is indicated, it's recommended to initiate within the first 24 to 48 hours of hospital admission. So basically immediately. Um, the reason why enteral nutrition is preferred early is because it promotes gut integrity. So if you're feeding the gut, you're using the gut, your little microvilli in the gut are actually functioning and that actually promotes immunological responses, which are very pro-immunity and will actually help prevent infection. So using that gut will actually um, stimulate normal um, bodily functions. Now, in terms of enteral nutrition and how to start enteral nutrition, now, as remorse pharmacists, we won't be necessarily writing the orders for these most of the time, but just to get an idea, they actually start at a low rate of 10 to 20 mils per hour and then get advanced by 10 to 25 mils um, per hour every four to eight hours uh, until the caloric goal is actually reached. So a lot of times these enteral nutrition formulas are actually titrated up to the calorie goal or the protein goal, depending on what goal you actually set. It's important to be cautious whenever you use enteral nutrition during hemodynamic instability, especially whenever your patients are on high dose pressors. So if your patient is hemodynamically unstable and has a low blood pressure, for example, because your patient has a low blood pressure, not a lot of that blood is actually getting, you know, um, flowing to that gut area. And whenever you don't have a lot of blood flowing to that gut area, your gut actually starts to, you know, die essentially. Now, it's not fully dead, but it likes to be used because it promotes immunity as well as other normal bodily functions.
However, whenever you're hemodynamically unstable, if you're feeding a patient with EN, that gut won't be able to function normally because it doesn't have enough blood flow. So things such as digestion may not happen as easily, and that's why you may actually hold EN or be very cautious about using EN in these patients who are hemodynamically unstable. Um, some complications of enteral nutrition include fluid overload, hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal distension. So, the, so these last two are things that are specific to the GI tract, specifically. Aspiration, such as an aspiration pneumonia. Infection, which as we stated, um, enteral nutrition does promote immunological function. However, you have to think about it from the perspective that inserting a tube down your esophagus and through your sinuses actually may promote sinusitis, um, as well as some other potential infections. But in terms of the risk compared to parental nutrition, it's much, much less. You may, you may also have a syndrome called refeeding syndrome, which we mentioned earlier happen, which this is actually mostly seen in malnourished patients who begin feeding. Now, whenever you have patients who are malnourished, not a lot of their bodily processes are happening as quickly. So whenever you start feeding them again, and you start feeding them glucose specifically, that glucose will go through stimulant glycolysis and promotion of a lot of other um, proteins, other factors. It'll also stimulate other bodily processes such as insulin secretion. And whenever your body starts stimulating insulin, then a lot of things get ramped up. However, whenever your bodily processes start functioning at a more higher level than they do whenever your patient is malnourished, you have specific cofactors um, and electrolytes as well as macronutrients that act for cofactors act as factors for a lot of different bodily processes. So these factors start getting used up a lot more in the body. And that's how patients actually develop electrolyte disorders and refeeding syndrome. Um, specifically hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, and hypomagnesemia. Because these are electrolytes that start getting used up in different bodily processes whenever patients start um, getting more nutrition um, administered to them. Essentially, these different electrolytes are starting to get used up by the different metabolic pathways that are occurring in the body. And that's why you may see patients who get these electrolyte disorders. So in these patients, it's actually important to start dextrose out at lower amounts, such as at 150 grams to start with, and then titrate it up slowly to try to minimize the risk of hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia. In terms of internal nutrition, you also have not only metabolic complications as well as GI complications, you potentially have mechanical complications. So some things include tube occlusion. So say if you have improper medication administration through the feeding tube, or if you have improper flushing of the feeding tube, these can be potentials for the tube being occluded, particularly medications that should not be administered through, in, through um, internal nutrition, which we'll talk about shortly. You also may have tube malposition, and it may result from inserting the tube in the wrong position. So essentially that tube may not be terminating in the gastric or stomach area like we wanted it to be, or the patient may have actually manipulated the feeding tube themselves. So they may have poured on the feeding tube, say if they were agitated, and it actually may change the actual delivery location of the tube feeding. Now, depending on what actually occurs, you actually may um, have a result of nasopulmonary intubation whenever this tube is moved around too much, 
or if it's inserted incorrectly. So essentially, instead of depositing in the gastric area, you may actually have a deposit in the lungs. And if you think about it, if you're delivering nutrition via this route and you're delivering nutrition into the lungs, that can potentially kill the patient, unfortunately. So that's why it's always important to confirm tube placement with radiography, such as a chest x-ray, to make sure that that tube is actually terminating in the correct place. In general, it's important to flush the feeding tube with 15 to 30 mils of water or normal saline before and after medication administration. Now, it's debatable whether or not you can use water or you should use water, as water can be provided as tap water or purified water, for example. And tap water has obviously its inherent risk of being a non-sterile entity, which is why a lot of nurses will actually use normal saline flushes. Um, it's important not to flush these um, enteronutrition tubes with cola or juices as they actually become very, very sticky and they can occlude that way. Now, in terms of medication delivery, as pharmacists, it's important to know um, a little bit of background behind medication delivery in terms of enteral nutrition. So certain oral medications can be administered for, through a feeding tube. After crushing and mixing these medications in water or normal saline. However, there are some medications that should never be put down a feeding tube as the absorption component of the pharmacokinetics may be altered. So if you think about dosage forms such as sublingual medications, if you mix these in water, for example, they'll dissolve, um, but they may not get the proper absorption where they need to be absorbed. If you crush sustained or extended release medications and put them down a feeding tube, um, the amount of drug being actually administered to the patient may actually increase because these medications were meant to be extended released um, and released over a longer period of time. If you crush them, you may actually turn them into immediate release and depending on what drug it is, it can actually be very dangerous. Um, enteric coated medications should not be crushed. The most common one is aspirin. Um, so in this case, you would actually um, advocate for you using chewable aspirins to crush during um, for tube feeding if you need medication administration via that route. So use chewable aspirin, not enteric coated aspirin. Another big one. That is a common board question, because I actually had this on one of my critical care boards, was um, crushing dabigatran. Now, if you crush dabigatran, the actual exposure you get to the drug increase, increases, um, I believe, more than twofold, and can actually put the patient at increased risk of a bleed. So it's important never to crush dabigatran Ever. If you have a patient that's on dabigatran and they can only get oral medications by in, um, enteral feeding or tube feeding, then you need to switch agents potentially. There are also potential drug nutrient interactions that are important to be aware of with internal nutrition. Some of the common ones are listed here. One of them is phenytoin. Um, if you administer phenytoin with internal nutrition, you may get potential reduced bioavailability with tube feeding. But you can still potentially give it um, via tube feeding if tube feedings help at one or two hours before and after phenytoin administration. However, it's debatable whether or not this actually works or not. Um, in either case, if you don't feel comfortable with it or you're still getting low phenytoin serum concentrations, um, after administering phenytoin via feeding tube, you can convert it to the IV formulation. Those are both acceptable options.
in terms of antibiotics, fluoroquinolones and tetracyclines are one of, or a couple of the biggest medications that have drug interactions, particularly due to drug complexation with trivalent cations. So one of the most common ones I think of is calcium supplements. And with enteral feeding, enteral feeding um, actually contains calcium throughout um, as an electrolyte. So it may be prudent to hold to feeding one hour before and after or even more um, whenever you're administering these drugs or potentially for flor the fluoroquinolones or the tetracyclines convert to IV. Warfarin is another big drug that has drug nutrient interactions with internal nutrition. One of the big problems with warfarin is that whenever you administer it with enteral nutrition specifically, it may actually result in decreased absorption. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you if you have a patient who's eating normally with normal oral feeds that you can't get warfarin. Um, it's something specific with the enteral nutrition formula that ca that potentially causes the decreased absorption. Um, now you can still give warfarin um, via the feeding tube. However, you may have to adjust the dose based on the INR level. So say if your INR level um, is low and your patient's on too many, you just may need to increase it. So think about it you know, from a standard perspective. But it's also important to be very careful, say if your patient gets taken off of tube feeding, your warfarin requirement may change. Now that we've talked about enteral nutrition, let's talk about parenteral nutrition or IV nutrition. So going back to our little diagram here, remember we talked about if you had a functional GI tract, you got enteral nutrition. How if you don't have a functional GI tract, you actually may be a candidate for parental nutrition. So parental nutrition is also known as TPN or total parental nutrition is another name that they have for it. And it's delivery of nutrients via an IV line into systemic circulation. So as you see here, you have a TPN bag with the different components, macronutrients, micronutrients, trace elements, vitamins, etc. IV tubing and it runs through an infusion pump and eventually into some kind of IV access, whether that be peripheral or central. So those are two different types of access that you have with parenteral nutrition. Peripheral parenteral nutrition or PPN and central parenteral nutrition or CPN. The first one we'll talk about is peripheral parenteral nutrition, also known as PPN. So this is delivery of nutrients via a peripheral line into systemic circulation. So this is used when central IV access is unavailable and when GI function is expected to return in the next 10 to 14 days. So this is a short-term solution. It is limited by dilute large volumes to provide nutrient requirements. What I'm meaning by this is that you actually have to provide a lot of volume and in a dilute form to provide a patient's macronutrient and micronutrient requirements. It has limitations in terms of how much you can actually put in the bag because the bag cannot exceed 900 milliosmoles per liter due to risk of thrombophlebitis or essentially vein irritation. So in terms of how much you can actually fit in a peripheral parental nutrition bag, I would say, you know, no more potentially than a thousand kilocals whenever you actually calculate this milliosmole amount out. So osmolarity is contributed by all the, um, most of the components of the PPN formula. Um, the main ones are dextrose, amino acids, fat emulsion, as well as electrolytes. And you see the different osmolarity um, number assignments that they have here.
So whenever you add up how much is actually going to be put in that PPN bag, this cannot exceed 900 millimoles. Now it's not important for you, for the test purposes, to memorize these numbers to do the calculation. However, it is important to realize that you can't exceed 900 milliosmoles per liter due to the risk of thrombophlebitis. So we will calculate this out whenever we do um, our VAT or potentially on our lab day. But these numbers you do not need to know off of the top of your head. They are not bolded. So that is peripheral parental nutrition. Now we're going to talk about central parenteral nutrition or CPN. It's also delivery of nutrients, but this one is via a central line into systemic circulation. And this is the preferred route for parenteral nutrition delivery. So if you're going to do parenteral nutrition, it's ideal to do it via the central route, not peripheral, unless you do not have a central line. If you do not have a central line, that may be reason to do peripheral. It's used when parental nutrition is required for more than 7 to 14 days or potentially indefinitely in patients who have chronic disease states where they don't have functioning GI tracts. Now, as we said, a central line is necessary, and this can come in many different forms. Um, some sample ones or sample lines that can be used are peripheral inserted central catheters or PIC lines implanted ports, which are commonly seen with patients who get chemotherapy, they actually will get ports, and then tunneled central venous catheters, um, emphasis on the word central here. Tunneled just means that it's essentially, you know, moved up further down instead of depositing where you directly insert it, it's actually moved further down, and this actually has less risk of infection. But any time that you do have a central line though, you will have a risk of infection, which we'll talk about in a moment. An important part of central parenteral nutrition compared to peripheral parenteral nutrition is that it's not limited by osmolarity. This is the big point here. Not No limits for osmolarity here. So it can actually be infused at greater than 900 milliosmoles per liter. Now, some parenteral nutrition indications. Um, so, remember, parenteral nutrition is given to patients who do not have a functional GI tract or cannot meet nutritional requirements from enteral nutrition alone. So, say if you have a patient who is on enteral nutrition and you can't titrate it up um, to the calorie goal because your patient is not able to tolerate the enteral nutrition, potentially because of, say, fluid overload, for example, then you may actually be indicated for parenteral nutrition. So some indications for parenteral nutrition include a small bowel section. So in terms of these patients, they may have some part of their bowel that is not there anymore. Um, short bowel syndrome, which typically may result as a result of a short bowel section. So in terms of short bowel syndrome, these patients may not be able to properly absorb nutrients via the GI tract, or even medications for that matter. Ileus is another big parental nutrition indication. So essentially what ileus means is a slowing down or stopping of GI tract function. And a lot of times this happens after surgery of the GI tract area. If you have intractable nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea or on enteral nutrition, you may be indicated for parental nutrition um, as a result of a tolerance issue. If you have a bowel obstruction, so if there is some area in your bowel where you have an obstruction that is precluding the contents from moving forward, this may be an indication. If you have GI fistulae, so fistulas or fistulae are essentially disconnections whenever you have potentially an opening of a GI tract to somewhere else where it's not where it's not supposed to be open to. And these little fistula, fistulae will actually leak out nutritional contents into whatever area they leak out into and will actually cause a patient to be or 
cause a patient to have decreased nutrition delivery to their systemic circulation. Volvulus is essentially a twisting of the intestines, which may result from different kind of nutritional impactions or potentially even fecal impactions. So essentially what happens is your intestines twist around and basically um, are kinked to where nutrition can't go forward. Chyle leaks are essentially a leak of a fluid called chyle from the lymphatic system um, out into areas where that fluid should not be. So for example, into the thorax or into the peritoneal space, so chylothorax or chylocystitis. If you have a patient with severe pancreatitis who is not a candidate for EN, potentially because of intractable nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, if you have a patient with cancer who's not a candidate for EN, potentially because of absorption issues or nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Or if you have Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, if your patient is not a e candidate for EN. So you always want to trial oral feeds first. If they can't tolerate oral feeds, then you do enteral nutrition. If enteral, nu if enteral nutrition um, is predicted not to work or is not indicated, then you will eventually go to parental nutrition for these patients. So kind of alluding to what we were talking about earlier in the talk, parental nutrition is composed of macronutrients, so protein, dextrose, lipids, which the lipids can actually be given with the other PN components, which is also known as a three-in-one solution. So you're giving all three of the macronutrients together in one bag. Um, so that's a three in one. And that actually requires a 1.2 micron filter. So this filter is placed um, um, distally from the TPN bag um, to filter out components of the fat emulsion. Now, lipids can also be given separately from other PN components, such as that intralipid bag, which I showed you earlier. And this is what's called a two-in-one. So you have protein and dextrose together, and then you have lipids on the side. Um, now, two-in-one solutions, which is the dextrose and protein, require a, a 0.22 micron filter for the dextrose protein-containing corn, and a 1.2 micron filter for the fat emulsion. So you, essentially are requiring two filters here. Now, parental nutrition also includes um, electrolytes, trace elements, and vitamins, as we discussed earlier. Um, however, parental nutrition can also contain medications, which as pharmacists, it's important for us to be aware about. Um, it can contain regular insulin for patients who are hyperglycemic or potentially have some kind of diabetes history. And one general rule that may be used is to provide up to 10 units per 100 grams of dextrose for hyperglycemia. Now, it's not always indicated to start regular insulin in a TPN bag. Personally, my practice is not to do it, um, but that will not be necessarily like a question on the test. Um, now, what I... Um, what, but it's important to be aware about how much you can provide in terms of regular insulin. And we'll have some examples of this in terms of applications. Um, you can also provide other medications in a TPM bag, such as PPIs, and, and as well as H2 blockers. So essentially pantoprazole, infomotidine, in um, the inpatient setting. When to start parental nutrition. So it's very important to know when to start parental nutrition because as we'll talk about um, a little later, parental nutrition has risk associated with it. So PN may be initiated if EN is contraindicated and a patient has had nothing by mouth for seven days. This is the standard indication for PN. So say if your patient is contraindicated on enteral nutrition, they can't get enteral nutrition for one of the previous mentioned indications. We cannot give parental nutrition for seven days. Um, and this is based off of studies that have shown increased risk of complications by giving PN too early. Now, if your patient is severely malnourished and does not qualify for EN, then you may start PN immediately. So if your patient is malnourished and fits one of the criteria 
for malnutrition that we talked about earlier in the talk, such as BMI less than 18, a reduced energy intake less than 50% over five days or less than 75% over a month, or a weight loss, a significant weight loss over one, three, six, or 12 months. Then in those cases where you have a patient who has a diagnosed malnourishment or malnutrition, then in those cases, those patients need nutrition immediately, and then you may start for normal nutrition immediately. Now, going to the complications I was alluding to in perinatal nutrition. So, similar to internal nutrition, you may have improper, improper catheter positioning, which is also important to confirm placement of radio, radiography because this is also fatal. Um, like enteral nutrition, you have hyperglycemia risk and hypertriglyceridemia risk as a result of the macronutrient components. Now, in terms of infection, infection risk is higher for patients who are getting parental nutrition than enteral nutrition because if you think about it, you have patients who are essentially getting nutrition via a peripheral line or even a central line. And the central line is the biggest risk of developing an infection. So that will be important to know, to know and to think about whenever you're feeding a patient. Because if you have a patient who requires parental nutrition and your preferred route is central because you can't get enough nutrients with the peripheral route, because you're inserting a lumen into the patient's systemic circulation, especially centrally, where a lot of your blood flow is occurring, that is what puts you at a higher risk of infection than, say, if you were to be on EN. You also have risk of refeeding syndrome, like enteral nutrition, and again, this is seen in mostly in malnourished patients who begin feeding. Another thing that you may potentially have a problem with is parental nutrition associated liver disease or PNALD. So for these patients, if you're getting parental nutrition for prolonged periods of time, say weeks or even months, you may develop liver disease because your liver is having to metabolize nutrition constantly um, over 24 hour periods, seven days a week. And in these patients, to try to minimize this risk, we may consider a strategy called cycling which is essentially reducing the amount of infusion time for a parental nutrition bag. So parental nutrition bags commonly infuse over 24 hours. Now, if you cycle a patient, they may infuse over a shorter period of time, such as anywhere from, you know, 12 to 20 hours, for example. You, have, you may also have patients who develop essential fatty acid deficiency, um, especially if these patients are not receiving fat emulsion because they may potentially have contraindications. Another complication you may see is metabolic bone disease, and this complication happens over prolonged periods of time. So more along the lines of must in terms of metabolic bone disease. In terms of monitoring parental nutrition, there are many labs and vitals as well as other markers that you look at. This just gives you an overview. I don't expect you to memorize these, but I, um, whenever you do go into practice, you will need to be aware of these because sometimes whenever you're the pharmacist and you have to order a TPN, you also have to be responsible for monitoring it. So there are certain labs that you obtain at baseline, daily, couple of times a week or even weekly. This is just a standard parental nutrition ordering form that is typically used either on the outpatient side or even in the hospital, for example. So you see you have basically a little bit of everything that we discussed earlier. So we talked about administration route, we talked about rate and volume a little bit, um, as well as fluid requirements. Um, cycling we just talked about, uh, macronutrients, micronutrients here, potentially insulin as well as other additives like vitamins and trace elements, um, as well as drugs such as famotidine.
So this is just one sample form that can be potentially used to order parental nutrition. And we'll kind of use something along these lines whenever we're actually doing parental nutrition writing in the lab on Thursday. Another thing that we didn't necessarily talk about specifically um, is specialized populations. So um, the talk we had today was a very, you know, generalized um, basic introduction to nutrition. But overall, um, depending on what kind of population you have, each population has its different nutritional requirements. So for example, in stage renal disease, these patients may actually need less electrolytes, say if they're on hemodialysis and they're accumulating um, they're accumulating electrolytes. Or they may actually need more electrolytes, say if they're on continuous renal replacement therapy and a lot of the electrolytes are taken off. You also have special considerations potentially for cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease. So one of the ones that we talked about was the trace elements. You also have critically ill patients who we actually talked about as well, who may actually need increased calorie and protein requirements. Oncology patients have their own calorie requirements depending on what type of cancer they have. Pediatric patients, surgical patients, gastrointestinal disease patients all have their specific um, requirements. And then whenever you have patients on the inpatient side who eventually get transitioned to the outpatient side and are still requiring parental nutrition to suffice their nutritional needs, some of them may need to go on home parental nutrition, which is a whole different monster in terms of trying to order and monitor because now, instead of monitoring your patients daily, you're monitoring your patients potentially weekly or even monthly. So, in some cases, home care can actually be a little more dangerous than inpatient. Here are the references for today's talk. So we're going to go back to our case. So we have AF, he's our 42-year-old male presenting to the emergency department with sepsis as a result of pneumonia. He was intubated and transferred to ICU. Central line nasal gastric tube replaced. He's currently, he currently has a functional GI tract and is not currently on vasopressors. So based on the weight-based equations, what are AF's calorie requirements? And the answer here is 25 to 30. And the reason why it's 25 to 30 is because if you remember for patients who are critically ill in the ICU, those patients need a higher requirement. Now, in terms of an answer of rarer than 30, that more correlates with patients who um, have major burns, for example. Um, in terms of 20 to 25, that's part of the range for a normal healthy patient. And 15 to 20 kilocals per kilo of actual body weight is actually under dosing compared to all of our other patient populations we talked about. Which type of nutrition is most appropriate for AF to receive? The answer here is enteral nutrition. The reason why it's enteral nutrition is because this patient still has a functional GI tract. Um, and the fact that this patient also just got intubated. Now, whenever you get intubated, you have a, essentially an endotracheal tube down your throat, and you may not be able to swallow oral nutrition. So that's why oral nutrition is not indicated here. If this patient did not have a functional GI tract, peripheral or central nutrition may be indicated. However, if they did not have a functional um, GI tract in this case, more likely central parental nutrition would be indicated since it is the preferred route and this patient has a central line. What is the most likely complication of the type of feeding selected in case question two? The answer here is abdominal distension. So it's abdominal distension because remember, if you're giving something in enterally, you also have risk of GI side effects. So abdominal distension may be one of those.
Um, hypokalemia may result as a result of refeeding syndrome, but as we said, that our patient was not malnourished. So if the patient was malnourished, this could potentially be an answer. However, this is not the case. Metabolic bone disease is a complication associated with parental nutrition long term. Um, and PN associated liver disease or PNALD is also associated with parental nutrition long term. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Have a great day.